talking about uh, the Cosby Show, talking about other dynamics. You want to introduce yourself? I know the audience already knows you. Ah, yeah, Vic Carnell, BreakingBrown.com, and Your Black World. Y'all already know me, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I saw the Cosby Show uh, podcast yesterday, and I really thought it was just a phenomenal analysis of the Cosby Show. I thought it was just a, a, a powerful time to finally start discussing some of the elements around the Cosby Show, so I reached out. And I just wanted to talk to you a bit, less of an interview, more of a discussion between a Howard grad and a UCLA grad <laughs> about how it uh, impact us and how we see it impact the world around us. Yeah. Um, so basically, you know, we, we're all talking about this because of the, the epic piece, you know, the epic piece. Many pieces of shattered glass on Bill's face. And what, what started this is the, is the rape allegations and, and what it's going to leading to is actually a larger discussion about the Cosby show and why it was so successful and whether that was necessarily purely good for black people. And I guess I wanted to just kind of get your opinion and just kind of start a discussion and talking about like how we both see it and then, and then go from there. Well, I, I think for me, like this is, this has been kind of difficult for me, right? Because I have sort of mixed feelings on, on one hand. I'm like, you know, this wasn't this wasn't representative of 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 you know black life or New York black life <laughs> you know for black people and so I I find it you know on, so on one hand I find it sort of difficult right that the black people were were so attached to that but on another hand I understand that this is this is sort of aspirational right this is sort of in a way this is sort of like I was telling a friend the other day this is sort of like mythology. We, 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 we built this into this myth. This was, this was, this was the hero's journey for us. This was where we wanted to go. Even if we weren't Cosby, this is where we wanted to arrive. We wanted to arrive at a place where, you know, if you, if you know, you have a, you have an attractive spouse who has a good job and you have beautiful kids, you have a beautiful family and you do stuff that other people do. Like you're regular, like you're not a gang banger or, you know, you're not depicted in that way. You are regular people. But on the other hand, it's kind of like, this is you you have to kind of keep in track of like who's making this right who's making this this is this is this is a commodity this is this is capitalism so this is being made to to enrich certain people it's not even made to 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 help you in that way it's not you know it's it's so on the other hand that's how i think i'm like sometimes it's kind of dangerous to get that caught up in something that's being commoditized and kind of marketed to you but on the other hand i understand why because you know this was this is sort of like derives all the way from king's dream right one day my my kids will sit next black and all and that's kind of that's kind of that's kind of where our thinking is and where it was so we you know we were aspirational but the problem with being aspirational is, is we didn't pay attention to some other stuff that was going on no, I, I absolutely agree. Agree. I did a piece on the Huffington Post, and so it was on the actually cover of the whole site yesterday because they liked it so much. And it's Cosby Show Dreams and African American Financial Reality. Great piece. And, um, and some of what I what I talk about is that I actually have a line in there where I talk about the the the, the reality that America wanted to be post racial before it was time to be post racial. And so, mm. like, you have this presentation of the Cosbys a mere twenty years after Jim Crow signs hung, and we have to be Begin to look at what the Cosby's were as a family, and I do agree on, on the whole I dynamic. We needed to see nuclear families, but we can't deny that we had seen a nuclear family in good times. And I think one of the things that I, I really hate about what happened to Black America is we threw good times under the bus for the Cosby Show in some ways, in my mind, and we called them poor, and we didn't call them working class. We we, we presumed that they were there because they they didn't do something right, and, yeah. and in actuality. It's a systemic reality behind the good times example. And we'll, we'll go further into the, like the structural dynamic of how many families are actually like good times versus how real the cosmic presentation really was in the conversation. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, I mean, I'll be perfectly honest with you. Let me just be honest with you. Like, I come from a working class family, right? Both of my both of my parents were factory workers. I, I they weren't college grads, none of that, you know. So it's always funny when people are like you. You just the elite. Yeah, I'm first generation college dude. Come on. But even my dad was like, like he didn't like you watching Good Times. Like he was like, the last thing you need to see is like a, a poor nigga. Like that's not what you want to do. You know what I mean? Like that representation is not what people wanted in their head. Like everybody was aspirational. Like that's what we wanted. Like even people who were working at factories and stuff wanted their kids to grow up and be the Cosbys, not grow up and be like the people on Good Times. So that's why so much of that is aspirational to me. And this is and this is the the, the, the quintessential question: Is it is it successful if you're apolitical? Or if you're if you don't talk about race as a black person in America, because because 
as much as people can argue about the paintings and the people that Cosby invited to his house, he purposefully left out race. And this is just out of his mouth. So he knew that he would make white people feel like villains if he talked about race. And is that a success if you actually end up going to college, becoming a lawyer, which I am right now, and then you don't talk about race and you don't do these kind of dialogues? And I think that one of the things that I feel happened, because it's interesting hearing your story, because my mom had me at 6, 17. So I was exactly Rudy's age, mm -hmm. but my reality was exactly opposite of Rudy's. And so when I look, look at what the Cosby did, when I got to UCLA, it felt like in so many ways, many of our black people did not discuss race properly. And I won't say that's just because of the Cosby show, but the role of having a, a, a apolitical, a non-racist show definitely played a part. And we got to be honest about that. Yeah, I think you do. I think I think what we it's not even that we didn't discuss race like we learned how to discuss race in all the wrong ways. Like you you learn to discuss race is just OK, we got to work twice as hard. You know, what I mean, the, the, yeah. and, and that's and that was accepted like like that. No, that's not right. Like that's not and that's not fighting back, like working twice as hard, doing what's demanded of you in this sort of capital capitalist society is not what I consider fighting back. That's not fighting the machine. That's working yourself to high blood pressure, stroke and everything else while the other person works half, you know, while the, while the white person works half as long and doesn't get half as tired, and, you know, and probably gets double as much. So we learn to talk about race in the sense of in. And, and you know I'm 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 not a fan of Booker T. Washington. So we learn to, to to talk about race in this sort of Booker T. Washington frame, as if everything would be okay if we work hard. And the thing about it is that that method failed after Booker T. Washington said it. Like it was a it's been a failure for for a very long time. You know what I mean that that whole idea has been a failure. It has failed us. This idea that you know we, it will be a meritocracy as long as we hard work. But you saw that kind of you know surge again. You saw a resurgence of that with the with with the Cosby show and even with a different world to a certain extent, you know, if just, you know, I remember Dwayne saying something like that, you know, we have to work twice as hard as if we've accepted, you know, this sort of, you know, this sort of, this sort of unfairness that, that has been put forth to us. So I think what we learned is like to talk about race in a way that's kind of, I don't even like the word empowering because it's so overused, but we learn to talk about way on a race that's not empowering and is devoid of actual data. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, 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 so, and so you started to see people deal with race as though it's an individual choice. Mm -hmm whether we are involved with race. And so I, I think that what happened was we created a dynamic where you could opt out of that, that, of that process, and it's just not true. And so I, I feel like in so many ways, like what, when we look at, at the racial dynamic of what the Cosby's did as far as being in this Brooklyn brownstone that's worth a million dollars almost, they created a dynamic that if you go to school, you're going to end up with that for so many black kids that had no exposure. And now, here we are 24 years later, where 20 years later, where black kids that went to school and went and got law degrees and went to medical school are far in debt and far away from that. Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of them, as a result, are blaming themselves instead of looking at the systemic reality of what blackness means in this country, what FHA loans and redlining was in 1960s, and how our families got here. Uh, and how mass incarceration developed, which, I, again, you know, I, I produced the documentary Freeway Crack in the System, which was on Al Jazeera. And I got to really talk to the guy that wrote the crack sentencing laws. And he talked about how they targeted certain groups and how these were the low hanging fruit. And I, I guess my, my main thing is to say the dynamic that allowed the Cosby's to exist was quasi documentary. It was it was less fictional and more. This is a realistic alternative. And I think that's part of the problem with the Cosby show, unlike the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, where they didn't honestly say, we're on TV, but we're only TV. They said, we're the alternative in so many ways and so many interviews. And so what happened was people then took to that as though that there's only two kinds of black people, the crack dealer and the Cosby's. No, there was good times. There was Rock, on, uh, on, uh, yeah. who was a garbage man, and his wife was an RN. There's so many different kind of other d dynamics of, of people who were working class who didn't get proper representation that had struggles. Yeah, no, I, I think that's totally true. And you said something very interesting that I hadn't even thought about before we went on. You said something about the cost of the house. You know what I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Like, I talk about that in my piece. And so, you know, what people have to understand is that, you know, black people weren't talking in millions in the late 70s. You know, in the late 70s, you're talking about, this is before Barry Gordy sells to EMI, um, sells Motown to EMI. This is before uh, Magic Johnson making a million dollars a year. So the context of a, a black family 
in a seven hundred thousand dollar brownstone has to really be questioned, not because it couldn't exist, but because it was a very rare occurrence. And so, like, what people will say is that, well, maybe they got it in the 60s. And those people, I would say, go look up FHA loans in the 60s and go look up redlining. One black person in a neighborhood gave that whole neighborhood a D. And so if you think it was in the 60s, you might want to understand redlining tie coats um, covers it really well in the, in, the, in the reparations piece he did. But coming forward into the 80s, I think we have a, a problem as people in looking at the world as we live it today. And you have to look at the world as it was at that moment. And you have access to the Internet to show you. Home loans were 18.5%. They were 18.5%. You know, So we're talking about a house that's $700,000. And then you have to go put a down payment of $100,000 in 80s money. And then you got to pay a loan at 18%. I just think that the uh, $10,000 a month. I just think the reality of who owned these homes around the Cosby's and how a working class family, let alone an upper middle class family, wouldn't have been in that neighborhood most likely. They might have been in a different neighborhood. And, and so, you know, what my, What the argument has been against that is, well, they always show people in different and higher homes than they're supposed to be on TV. What I would say is, but they don't always represent those people as a normal representation of a class of people. Mm -hmm. This was the normal representation of black middle class from middle to upper, but in actuality, they were the rare occurrence. Yeah, I, I, I you know, it's, it's, it's funny, like, you know, it's funny you mentioned that and people, a lot of people say, well, isn't it, you know, isn't it good? Like the argument to that is, well, isn't it good that they wanted, that they show black people that they could be doctors and lawyers? And I'm like, yeah, that's kind of what I used to think until, until like this housing bubble, right? That's kind of what I used to think until like this, this, everything has crashed. Like what we have now is just like everything has crashed and black people don't know what to do. Like black people like have been sold the bill of goods. Like as long as you go to school, do the right thing, you're going to be okay. And like what's happened now is that black people are looking around and saying, look, I did all that stuff. And I'm screwed. That's powerful because I think in some ways what black people begin to misunderstand is what education actually is. See, they view education as the outlet. Mm -hmm. If you think about life and outlet and plugs, education is the plug into an outlet of networks, resources, and different things. But what happened during the era of the Cosby Show and, and, and the things around it was government work, affirmative action, allowed black people to not have to take the full brunt of private sector racism. So the number one employer of black America during this time and up until the present was who? The post office. The post office. Mm -hmm. How many people know black people that worked at the post office? Mm -hmm. Mamas, uncles, everybody yeah. else. And I'm saying, I guess, in so many dynamics to get to the point, we all went out and got these outlets, I mean, these plugs, and we're all holding them now. We paid a lot for them in years and money, yeah. but there's no outlet to plug it into as far as networks and resources. Or there's a very rare occurrence that there is one because we have to wait and hope that some white benevolent person allows us to plug, to into plug in out. yeah and that, that was a great that was a great study on that like not too long ago well it may have been like a year ago but that was a great study about how the you know when people are looking for people for job openings like most of the time what's happening now is that white people are hooking up people in their family who are unemployed yeah. so yeah. so you know this uh, this whole idea of working hard like no this is not a meritocracy these people are doing what's you know they're they're hooking up their brother-in-law or their cousin or they have the friend out in work it's like hey if you if you you know i've been out of work so th that's how hr is finding people hr isn't looking at your resume and saying you know oh you know get you in here for an interview like this is not how things work and so we bought into this idea that we live in a meritocracy and that's just crumbling down around us and i i you know you 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 have that same thing kind of with obama too with the sense of people look at that image and they say look at this you know we have this so we have arrived so we keep having these like moments where we think we've arrived in black america when actually we haven't arrived but that's what you know that's 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 our thinking yeah and and, and you know it's funny because in no way am I trying to say that the Cosby Show didn't have a positive influence. And I discussed this in my piece. Um, I, I, I say, actually, I just want to read a little section. As we look back at the show and its influence, we begin to perform a critique that is long overdue. I will say, undoubtedly, it's my belief that the show's legacy is one that reaches all the way to the White House. I agree with Oprah's statements. This is Oprah's statement. This, we probably wouldn't have the president we have in the White House right now had there not been the Bill Cosby show because the Bill Cosby show introduced America to a way of seeing black people. And so, I mean, I, I think that the interesting dynamic with Obama and with Michelle and seeing this black family is that the Bill Cosby show did introduce us to the exceptional black person. And But at the same time, it made it very hard 
for the struggling black person to say, I, I, I didn't live that life. I, I know you as a college student just said that you probably, how many times have you walked up to, to someone and they call you a Huxtable because you went to college? Yeah, they yeah, yeah. Understand. We like the we like the Huxtable. Especially you went to especially you went to like a you know HBCU type. You went to more. You I mean you went to Morehouse Film and how healthy you're like oh you like the Huxtable. Like no 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 <laughs> you know no no no. But that's that's kind of how we see ourselves and that's you know that's how we reach. That's that's our goal now. That's what I want. So then so then looking at it from uh, that dynamic, while we as 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 black people that say we're underprivileged and everything of the sort, we're watching the show. So we're a generation of white people that now are decision makers. Yeah. They sat and they watched this show and got their context for black people's lives and the reality of, of slavery's impact and Jim Crow's impact from this show. And somebody would say, that's not the show's fault, but the show set itself out as that. And so the show has to take on that responsibility. It set itself out as, a, as the alternative normal. And, and yeah. I, I think that people are not really accepting that it wasn't normal. And it wasn't just not normal for a few people. I did, I, I, you know, I hate talking in conjecture. I like talking in numbers. And so Credit Suisse did an analysis last year. And Harvard Business Review actually relied on that analysis. And they were trying to analyze the black 1%. And they really had time, hard, a hard problem finding blacks in the black 1%. So they had to come to the black 5%. And what, and what they actually said, and again, I also included this in my piece that, that we talked about earlier, Cosby Show Dreams, and what they found is that to get in the top 5% of black America, of top 5% of black American households, all you have to have is $356,000 in assets. In assets, not liquid. Not even liquid cash. <laughs> and, so, and so when you start to understand that, you start to understand the dynamic of black wealth and how non-existent it is. Do we have a few basketball stars in the Oprah? Yes, we do. But do we have this massive group of, 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 of people who own $8 million houses? And we have to start getting honest about that and why that's the case after our families built this place through slavery. Why, why, why are thinkers having challenged the system to do? I just got back from South Africa. In South Africa, you know, when apartheid ended, they said we want land. They said, mm -hmm. we want land. And they, they got less than they wanted. They only got 8% of land, but it got redistributed. In America right now, all of out of all the land, black people own like a percent and a half. Ted Turner owns almost, almost, yeah, he owns almost a whole third, state. <laughs> he, yeah. he owns a third of what all the black people own in land. And so <laughs> like, not to not, to, just, we own about 8 million acres, I think, of, of, of overall land. That's not, that's not farmable land. That's just overall land. And Ted Turner owns 2 million acres. And so I'm saying all this just to say we need to understand the dynamic of our wealth so that we can demand from because our education isn't ours now individually. It, it, I think that's one of the things that kind of came out of the Cosby's when you have a raceless kind of like like household is that it's your education. No, it, it is the communities in part because it's your job to to have these dialogues that we're having right now in your households. So your children are more aware so that they bring it to other children around them. And, and you know, that, that's just kind of how I feel about the whole the whole dynamic. And I commend Ebony. Uh, let me say that because I, I know it was hard to do that piece, let alone set it on the cover. I know it's a little more space because of, uh, and I'm not, I'm not at all saying that's positive. It was a rape case, but there's a little more space for dialogue around the Cosby's. But to still do that piece and challenge the audience to have this discussion, it must have been really hard for the editors. Well, I'm sure it was, but I, I mean, I was I was happy to see it because Ebony has been the bastion of 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 of, of aspirational Negroism. You know what I mean? In terms of, I mean, somebody uh, Pascal Robert put to, who I did the video. I did another video with the Cosby Show on. He sent me like this 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 Cosby Show, uh, not this Cosby Show, but this Ebony cover from like um from like the '80s, and it was like the black middle class, who's in and who's out. You know, and I'm just like that, like, th like this is this is where this is where we were. So for Ebony to, to for Ebony to now backtrack and be like, hey, you know, at least let's talk about this. Let's 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 really, you know, let's really get into this. And they and and the, the great thing they did, they didn't just put Cosby on the cover, right? And just be like, Cosby's a bad man or whatever. We already know about the allegations. They put the whole family on the cover with that broken glass. And the reason so by so pe so many people are so annoyed is because that whether you like it or not, that resonates. And the, you know, and like you're talking about the data. The data is so important because we have this meme going around right now. Oh my God, we got so many black millionaires and black billionaires. We could do all of this and have a community. And it's like, do you understand what share 
you know, of the population these guys represent. And then people say, well, we have black businesses, but black businesses, most black businesses are self-employed, right? It's one person. It's like, it's like, you know, yeah, I, yeah, it's, it, I have breaking brown media, so I had to turn it into an LLC. That's, that's me and like a few occasionally subcontractors, contractors. This is, we are not employing people. Like, so I think, you know, I think you're exactly right in terms of let's, let's, let's make this about the numbers. I said one time I was going to start a blog or something called By the Numbers Black or something because I, because it's like the numbers the numbers are what we need to pay attention to instead of what we what we are paying attention to right now which is symbols and symbolism that's what we pay attention to with the Cosby's that's that is the that, and the Obama are the continuation of that we love the symbol but that doesn't it's it's not it's not reality. When the president got in office initially, what he represented to a nation of kids was hope. You know, the hope of people all across the country, you know, who will look and see themselves and know the possibilities. To me, the idea of America is that no matter who you are, what you look like or where you come from, you can make it if you try. Jay-Z did. He didn't come from power or privilege. He got ahead because he worked hard learn from his mistakes, and just plain refuse to quit. That's the promise of this country. And all of us have the obligation to keep that promise alive. Whether you like it or not, that resonates. And, the, you know, and like you're talking about the data, the data is so important because we have this meme going around right now. Oh my God, we got so many black millionaires and black billionaires. We could do all of this and have a community. And it's like, do you understand what share? you know, of the population these guys represent. And then people say, well, we have black businesses, but black businesses, most black businesses are self-employed, right? It's one person. It's like, it's like you know, yeah, I, yeah, it's, it, I have breaking brown media, so I had to turn it into an LLC. That's, that's me and like a few occasionally subcontractors, contractors. This is, we are not employing people. Like, so I think, you know, I think you're exactly right in terms of let's, let's, let's make this about the numbers. <clears throat> I said one time I was going to start a blog or something called By the Numbers Black or something because I, because it's like the numbers the numbers are what we need to pay attention to instead of what we what we are paying attention to right now which is symbols and symbolism that's what we pay attention to with the Cosby's that's that is the that, and the Obama are the continuation of that we love the symbol but that doesn't it's it's not it's not reality and, and you know I did a I did a piece called Decking and Veil and I was really surprised because like Boss had picked it up and Madame Nowhere. And I really went into this concept of symbolism and really, you know, it was it was an old back to the veil and, you know, the duality of the veil. And so when you start to deal with the reality of this new veil of decadence where where, you know, I, I use I use this example to kind of explain it. But like, you know, whereas Dr. King was able to create empathy by getting showing Negroes being water holes uh, by, by white Southerners. Here we have apathy because of the Cosby show. And I'm not saying the Cosby show set out to make apathetic white people. But it happened as a result. Yeah. And, or, or showing NBA, these 18-year-old black kids walk up and give hugs to the commissioner of the NFL or the NBA over and over again as though it's, it's a normal occurrence in the black community. And so I, I think that what's happened is there's little energy to deal with the structural consequence of Jim Crow and slavery. I did a chart for the Grio where I showed uh, – you got to understand, and I think that most black people, if they just step back and understood this point, then they would really see it. And I might even cut it into this video just so they can see it. But slavery was all of the, like, if you were to take America, the 1600s, the 1700s, the 1800s, and then the 1900s, slavery was three of those, three of those boxes into a little bit, and I, I, people like to think that it just ended when Lincoln said, let the slaves be free. And to those people, I say, see slavery by another name, by Douglas Blackman. You can find it on, on uh, YouTube. It's a PBS documentary, and it shows you slavery lasted into the 1900s. It wasn't like, let the slaves mm -hmm. be free. There were no teeth to that statement. But let's just presume, let's just take the first three boxes, and those are all slavery. Then, yeah. for another uh, three quarters of the, of, the, of the fourth box, we had Jim Crow. <laughs> black people have been free for yeah. a, like a small yeah. section of time if you yeah. go back to the Cosby's it was like next to no time and I think that the expectation for us to be exceptional Negroes after all of this uh, oppression is just overstated
No, I, I I agree with everything. I agree with everything you just said. I agree, and I agree with everything you just said. And 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 given how media is sometimes used to 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 kind of manipulate or shape or whatever you want to call it, I I mean I have a hard time believing that this is kind of just happenstance. I think I think I think I think instead of look, we like I tell people all the time, we are currently in a libertarian. You know, we're we're headed towards libertarian America. You know, you see everything. We had a really really small window to get anything. From affirmative action, the civil voting rights, civil rights, sliver. Look at look at look at how long they look at how long we had that. Like we had that we had that less than a hundred, far less than a hundred years. This was we talking nineteen sixties and stuff, nineteen fifties, nineteen sixties. And then you then you then you look at that, you look at that, and they're already taking it away. Like they're already saying no to affirmative action. You see the Supreme Court gutting the Voting Rights Act. We are the 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 problem with symbolism is that people aren't paying attention to the fact that this stuff that we won, you know, or, or, or black people won, this stuff is over. You know what I mean? We don't have that support anymore. And instead of paying attention to the fact that we don't have any support and trying to build a framework and understanding and a reaction, you know, and a strategy to combat that, we're talking about, you know, oh, the Obamas and, oh, you know, people on Instagram. Yeah, empire. Oh, empire. People are online following 50 Cent, talking about, look at all the money he has, or Floyd Mayweather. I'm just like, don't you understand that the rug is being pulled out Right now, and, and, and part of the, the dynamic of the problem that comes out of uh, this symbolism is if it actually was a real symbol, it would be nice. Meaning, if yep. it actually was redistribution, you know, black we, black people probably don't really recognize America never apologized for slavery. Let alone move to the next step where you actually address it. So, like, the symbolism isn't even a symbol of actual redistribution of lands, redistribution of monies. Mm -mm. It's actually just kind of like, it's over, let's move forward kind of symbolism. Mm -hmm. And what you have as a consequence is a group of people who then have to carry the cost of, of slavery alone and they don't know that's what they're doing. Yeah. They don't know that many of these young black men are being pressured into a belief that they're going to make millions of dollars in a single lifetime from nothing, rapping. And yeah. that's going to fix out all of the problems of hundreds of years of slavery from their families. And, and, and I, I just think that, you know, bringing it back to the Cosby show, I think it was a, a positive image if tempered. I always use this example to explain black America to people. And I, I'm not going to be long when it's really short. I, I think sometimes black Americans don't understand what they're looking at when they look at themselves. They're not, we're not like Mexican Americans or Asian Americans. We're not an ethnicity, we're a race. A social construct and so as a result we experience america with no chaser and when i say no chaser the freedom of america we experience it without a counterculture in, in a true sense of language in a true sense of another country yeah so as a reason so what ends up happening is, is that when things come to us we actually just take it in whole whole shot and it's not an accident that it's really hard for them to make a cosby for any other <laughs> yeah. They're not trying to hear it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and and, and it would be it. it would be too complicated for them to do like they they do have that counterculture they to try. talk about. So they it, try. yeah, so it gets very complicated with us. You know, you're right. You're right about that. Yeah, and so like you know, as a result, we experience America like no other group. And so like when people think about like white people trying to be black and trying to be ghetto, nobody wants to be ghetto. They want to be free. Mm -hmm. What you see with uh, what, what they're trying to emulate is that freedom that we have to recreate language and music and everything else. And I think that one of the things that happened for black people inside of that freedom is the lack of ability to understand their position and ask for more. And so, like, we believe that we're so free that it's us that's holding us back. And you just got to think it through and it'll happen. And inside of that, we don't understand there has to be government support, particularly after what we went through in this country, to support your hope and support your dreams. Yeah. And I think that let me say, let me say, one of the other dynamics that the Cosby's brings about that nobody is talking about in Black America is ageism. It's a, it's a concept where those Blacks that were able to benefit from affirmative action, that were able to benefit from low cost housing, and 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 the transitionary period after redlining, are becoming the imagery that America sets out for Black America. But nobody talks about their children who are struggling. And mm -hmm. I'm not talking about the child who got on drugs. I'm talking about the child who yeah. went, to law, went to school, went to law school, came out, and there was no job. Yeah. There was no job. Not because of their efforts. And I don't want to hear, I mean, at what point do we say, okay, you got straight A's, you went to uh, UCLA or Howard. Then you got straight A's at Howard and you went to law school. And then you went there and you were okay. At what point do we say that? That's I'm not saying it's not your fault, but like you should at least get a job after that. 
Or do we then say, well, you should have got a straight A's in law school too? Yeah, it's always A. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's always, it's always, this is something that like you know is is and and this is that was a you know. I think it was in, 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 in like Frederick Harris Price of the Ticket, where he basically where he kind of talked about, and I think you know that was another read by Adolf Reed, but there where there were studies in like you know years and years ago. This isn't like the this isn't like when 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 black people started started migrating to Chicago and other places. Um, that there were upper class black people, and it, it, you still they did they did these kind of polls and surveys, and it was it was the same. Like people thought that a lot of the problems that black people were experiencing were caused by black people. It's probably it's probably exponentially more now. You know what I mean? Because at least they then had black publications, and people would talk about it, people would have conversations and stuff that we don't even we don't even for the majority of us don't even engage in now. So when I look at that, and I saw there was a there was a a, a study or something that was published in Business Insider, amongst other places, that said blacks are one of the one of the demographics that doesn't that no longer believes in redistribution. The, the number of us that are believing in redistribution is going down. Or, you know, so that I'm just like, how is that possible? Like, if you have an understanding of exactly what was taken and kept from us, how in the world are we people who are now saying no? We don't believe in we don't believe in redistribution well, anymore. Well, part of it is, I mean, if you come back to it, I mean, even thinking about. The upper middle classes. That's how people frame the cause. Now, from job point, they probably are. But from the actual number of kids in the house they live in, they're just rich and are wealthy, if you want to use that to make you feel a little better. So, like, the inability to count has come out of this. And so, when you look at good times, when you look at good times and you really look at, your, at, your, at some of your friends, is the difference between your friends and good times really the education or is it the access to credit? And so, yeah. I mean, is it, and so like, you have to remember it, those people couldn't get credit cards or student loans. There were no credit cards in 1973. Or maybe if you was like a, a doctor, maybe. And not even then. I mean, there was no concept of an unsecured loan like that. And so like, I think that in so many ways, our ability to access credit has masked the consequence of our legacy of poverty inside of our families. And as that credit window is squeezing, you're hearing less and less black people talk about housing. Your house home ownership. You're hearing less and less black people talk about this college, and it's it's going to be an interesting next few years as we have to find alternatives for our children to actually find employment in because there's no more garbage job, there's no more uh, post office yeah. job that's disappearing. And so what what then do you, when you really got to confront the reality that public sector jobs were help holding black America together, and the reason that that is the case is because in the private sector racism was rampant. Yeah, and I just I just make one last point. You know, it's funny people will say, well, you know, like when when Darren McKesson just discussed, he didn't go pro or con, but he discussed whether or not you know on his Twitter whether or not closing the post office or privatizing the post office was a good thing. I'm like, how is somebody who says Black Lives Matter, you know, asking whether or not even posing the question of whether or not cutting public sector jobs is a good thing? That's a qu a quarter of the people who work in public sector jobs are black people. That's that's like almost double, you know, the 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 number of us you know who are in this country. So you know the idea deal that's that that, that 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 and this is how confused we are in terms of data like data really matters you know data undergirds everything you know what you believe or what you think about streamlining or you know and i'm a person who puts people ahead of money every time every time there's every time there's a question i will put people who have skin and live and breathe ahead of dollars and cents every time so when i hear this sort of thing it, it it just makes it apparent to me how much how much the neoliberal idea of what it means to be an American and just everything is about feeding the machine in, in, a, in a certain way. Everything is about feeding capitalism as opposed to what's good and fair for human beings. And the problem is that so many black people have kind of bought into this idea, even though there's there there's no data that supports this as the way out of poverty. You know, there's there's, there's nothing. Yeah, and so like this aspirationalism. If the data actually like contrasts really hard with the world that you created, you know the poster on the wall world that you created, <laughs> uh, then will you want to see the data? If, I mean, if it literally shows you that what you believe makes no sense, you are gonna shut that data out. Now the the reality is that you're gonna have to deal with the consequences of shutting that data out. If I tell you today that the cre credit that the uh, that uh, Harvard Business Review did a study and they showed that to get into black 5%, all it takes is $350,000. That's a top 5% of black families, not individuals. And you and then you really want to challenge it. I say come back with data, not an emotional argument yeah. that you know two black millionaires. And so, like, I, I just think that right now where we're at because of the, the use of words like millions. Like in the 70s, man, if you talk to black people from, like, the 70s, they didn't even talk about millions. That was, like, a, a, a 
fantasy. They didn't even use those words. But we've used it so normal because of hip hop and because of TV shows. Like it's a normal occurrence for black America. But black in this country connects so so uh, intimately with struggle and poverty. Not because of our individual failures, but because of structural realities that pushed us down. Things like mass incarceration, which, which like I said, I detailed... I mean, as a former prosecutor, let alone as uh, doing this documentary where you really understand that they created a whole economic base on top of black male failure of jobs for police officers and judges and everyone else. And I think that we just we just really want to opt out. And inside of that, we're just causing ourselves so much harm because we're not addressing why we're here and then trying to at least find a plan to move forward, not even moving forward. That's the first step to, to really address the problem. No, I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. I can't. I, there's nothing I can add to that. I agree wholeheartedly with that. Well, thank you so much, man. Uh, I, I, like I said, I really appreciate it that you that you're here and that that dialogue that you did uh, yesterday on the Cosby Show, because you know what he was talking about was more of the philosophical part of it. And I think sometimes when we talk philosophically, it's totally accurate. But what ends up happening is that we get arguments where people respond emotionally. And mm-hmm. I just wanted to support him and you with some of the data so that we actually start talking about it. Because even after giving the data, the next step is to find some way that uh, the, the hospital gave Bill Cosby the house. And it's like, at some point, <laughs> you have to start getting honest about the reality that this wasn't presented as that. And why is it that we can't afford this kind of houses after we built the wealthiest country in the history of the world? That's it. <laughs> right. That says it all. Thank you. Thank you so much. No problem.